Okay, let us begin. Good morning. This lecture and the next one are really intended for those of you who have not already been introduced to the subject of black holes. So they'll both be fairly lowbrow lectures um, for, for some or many of you. Uh, but it still doesn't hurt to hear things again and perhaps said slightly differently. Before we begin, let us go back to our discussion of the stability of stars. And the reason I want to do this is the following. You will recall that the notion that massive stars or massive objects will collapse to a black hole dates back to 1939. And then the Second World War intervened. And after that, uh, uh, people became aware of this paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder. But uh, very few believed in it. Very few believed in it because of the uh, uh, strict assumptions made of spherical symmetry, lack of pressure, energy generation, and so on. And uh, the leading opponent of this uh, was John Wheeler in Princeton, who then later on turned out to be the messiah for black holes. In fact, he coined the phrase black hole. Uh, in the late 50s, 1950s, the computer code that was developed to build the first hydrogen bomb in Los Alamos was declassified. And uh, the world's uh, best computer was available in Los Alamos. So John Wheeler persuaded uh, three young uh, physicists, Colgate, White, and May, to do precisely the calculation that uh, young Snyder had done in 1938-39, but removing all the assumptions, all the assumptions. And they could now do it because this code was available. Of course, nobody else in the world knew such codes existed and had access to computers at the time. And after three or four years of very hard work, Colgate, May, and White found that um, uh, so low, lower mass stars became neutron stars, produced supernova explosions, confirming uh, Bade and Zwicky's conjecture. And then the massive stars not only collapse, but they coll uh, and the detailed behavior during collapse exactly reproduce Snyder's result. And at that stage, uh, John Wheeler became convinced that there is more to it than failure of general relativity, which is what people thought at that time earlier. And then, in 1963, the first quasar was discovered. And then the question was, what could be the central engine that produces 10 to the power 46 eggs per second? Various people came up with models, and the most popular model at the time was that it was a supermassive star of about 10 to the 8 solar mass, more or less a, a giant cloud of gas supported by radiation pressure. And Ginzburg in Moscow and uh, Fowler in Caltech were the leading uh, proponents of this idea. It was at just, just at the time Chandrasekhar was working on the complete theory of stability of stars in general relativity. This is a problem that he started working on with the, the great mathematician von Neumann in 1939 itself, but then the war broke and it got interrupted. And in that paper, in the first, there was, as usual, in every phase, Chandrasekhar's papers would have Roman numeral 1 to 75 um, series of papers. But in the very first paper, he concluded with a footnote where he said that about the, the paper was about uh, general relativity, but the footnote was about the discovery of quasars. And there he pointed out that this idea of a supermassive star 
is not a very valid one because such a star would be unstable in general relativity. So let us therefore, so that was the beginning. Um, and very soon people got on to that idea uh, in um, when Willie Fowler in Caltech was giving a talk expounding on this supermassive star idea. Apparently Feynman was in the audience and Feynman shook his head and said, no, such a star would be unstable in general relativity. And so Fowler also caught on to this idea. And, uh, uh, and then there was a big international conference that year in Texas on quasars. There was a plenary talk by John Wheeler in which black holes were resurrected as the leading candidate for uh, powering quasars. Um, so that's how the history evolved. And so let us go back and see what Chandrasekhar meant by this statement. I already said that in Newtonian physics, for a star to be stable, the ratio of specific heat should be greater than 4 by 3. If gamma is less than 4 thirds, then the compressibility of matter is negative. So if I compress a star and let go, it won't bounce back, but it will continue to collapse. So let us examine this more carefully, in case you have not encountered this. So I'll try to make this as uh, clear as possible. I want you to first look at this figure over here. I have a star of mass m and radius r. Inside that, I construct an imaginary sphere of radius small r. And the mass contained within that is m of r. Now I compress that star to a new that should not uh, be, OK, uh, there is another star m prime with the radius r prime. So let us introduce uh, a nomenclature. One says that one compresses a star homologously if r over r of this configuration is equal to r prime over r prime of that configuration, and the mass contained within r measured in units of this total mass is the same as the mass contained within that dotted sphere in terms of this. If this condition is satisfied, then one says in mathematics that r and small r and small r prime are homologous uh, points. Now, people who have done collapse of stars in the computer find that collapse is, in fact, homologous. Okay, So the density profile is maintained, if you like. But we will see that if the collapse of an object is not homologous, and there's no reason to panic, then what one does is instead of this adiabatic index, whose formal definition is d log p by d log rho, evaluated at constant entropy for adiabatic process, you take some average of this gamma over the star, and the most popular average is average over the pressure in the star. All right, now you keep this in mind. Now, the question that we want to ask within the framework of Newton's theory is, if I compress the star, what will happen to it? I've tried to indicate that here. So let us consider this imaginary sphere and ask what is the pressure on the surface of the sphere? Like the problem that I gave you a couple of days ago, the pressure is simply the weight of this unit cylinder sitting on top of the surface. Therefore, the gravitational pressure is integral of g m prime, which is the mass inside that sphere, d m prime, divided by 4 pi r squared, which gives me the pressure, integrated over this Lagrangian coordinate, small m to capital M. Now, let us compress this star homologously and adiabatically. And the question is, will the star remain in hydrostatic equilibrium? 
Now, look at the right-hand side of this uh, equation. Look at the integrand. If I compress the star from radius capital R to radius capital R prime, the right-hand side will vary as R prime by R to the power minus 4. The ratio of the right-hand sides will vary as R prime over R to the minus 4. Now, this pressure has to be balanced by the pressure of the matter. And in an adiabatic process, P V to the power gamma is a constant, or P is equal to rho to the power minus gamma. The, so the left hand, sorry, rho to the power gamma. The pressure varies, left hand side varies as rho prime, which is the density after compression divided by rho to the power gamma, or written in terms of the radii, it is r prime by r to the power minus 3 gamma. Now, you compare these two expressions, and it is immediately clear to you that if the adiabatics index gamma is greater than 4 by 3, the left-hand side will be stronger with compression than the right-hand side. Therefore, the pressure of matter increases faster than the weight, and the star will bounce back. If gamma is less than 4 by 3, the weight increases faster than the pressure, and the star will be unstable. So this 4 by 3, you notice that 4 comes from Euclid, and 3 comes from Newton. Think about that, OK? So if we go to general relativity, uh, this will be different. And that's what I'm coming to now. So what we said was, you saw this plot before, if I have equation of state, I can calculate gamma as a function of uh, log rho, and as long as gamma is greater than 4 thirds, uh, the star is stable, and then there is a phase of instability, and then a new equilibrium configuration occurs. So a white dwarf's classical gas, an ideal classical gas, gamma is 5 by 3. So as the density increases, gamma decreases, and the gamma becomes very nearly four-thirds as you approach the Chandrasekhar limiting mass. That's another way of saying is that the gas has become ultra-relativistic, for, because for photon gas, gamma is four by three. And so our instability point is over there, corresponding to 1.4 solar mass. Now, Chandrasekhar, this theory, of course, was an exact analysis of stability and general relativity. But uh, you can ask, in the Newtonian limit, what kind of correction does it give to Newtonian criteria for stability? So, in the post-Newtonian limit, Chandrasekhar found that the critical value of gamma is four-thirds plus something. And that makes sense because in general relativity, since all forms of energy contribute to gravity, so in a sense, gravity is stronger for the same baryon number as in Newtonian theory, so you would expect instability to be um, setting in sooner. And this factor here is the Schwarzschild radius gm over r, or the gravitational radius uh, gm over r. c squared, and some factor kappa, which is of the order of unity. So what I would like you to notice is that in general relativity, in the post-Newtonian limit, a star will become unstable before it reaches 4 by 3, even before it reaches, gamma reaches 4 by 3. Now, please remember that in Oppenheimer and Volkov, uh, turning point method, that was identified as the maximum mass of, uh, of the neutron star, and that was the Chandrasekhar limiting mass for white dwarf. And as I said, another way of analyzing this problem is to look at radial perturbation and ask what are the frequencies of radial oscillations, and if the, when the frequency goes to zero, instability sets in. So these two limiting masses 
are the points where the frequency of the radial oscillations goes to zero. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, let's go back to this plot. The stability limit is no longer the white dotted line, but it is the red dotted line, which is 4 by 3 plus kappa gm over rc squared. Therefore, whereas in the Newtonian theory, this star would have been stable up to that density, in general relativity, already at that density, this star has become unstable. You notice that when the star becomes unstable in general relativity, its density is rather small compared to this density, therefore its size is very large compared to what it was very close to the limiting mass. And the way of seeing that result is to rewrite this expression like this. The star will become unstable at a radius r, which we'll call r critical, which is kappa Schwarzschild radius divided by gamma minus 4 by 3. So as gamma, when gamma is very close to 4 by 3 here, if this term is small compared to 4 by 3 or close to this, this is close to 0. And therefore, this critical radius can be enormous. Detailed calculations by Chandrasekhar and Tuper in 1964 showed that a white dwarf will become unstable in general relativity when its radius is 5,000 times the Schwarzschild radius. And the star is extremely Newtonian at that stage. OK. Now, this is why. Chandrasekhar said that supermassive stars uh, would be unstable because they're supported by radiation pressure whose gamma is 4 by 3. And this I already narrated. Uh, this story about Feynman making this comment and so on is to be found in Kip Thorne's books. That's where I learned this from. Now, uh, as I said, Oppenheimer and Volkov calculated the maximum mass using the turning point criteria. Around the same time, Mishner and Zapolsky showed that at the turning point, the frequency of radial pulsations goes to zero, and the star becomes unstable, dynamically unstable, in Newtonian limit. The fact that both these criteria gave the same limiting mass has to do with the fact both for equilibrium analysis and vibrational analysis one use the same equation of state. Therefore, this is not highly surprising. Now, there is a, in 90, we'll come to this presently, there, is a, there was a paper by Carl Schwarzschild in 1916 in which he showed that the radius of an object in general relativity has to be necessarily greater than or equal to 9 by 8 times the gravitational radius. And that's an exact result, OK? And it's a result which is not very often uh, noticed by people. And this was pointed out by Schwarzschild that, the that, that there is an instability of a perfect fluid even before you reach the Schwarzschild limit itself. OK, so now we uh, go to Einstein's theory of gravity. You've all studied this. And if you have not studied this, this is not the occasion for me to uh, uh, tell you in detail about this. But I would like to uh, remind you a few things. First, well, this is what Einstein said. Scarcely anyone who fully understands this theory uh, can escape from its magic. Now, let us ask how Einstein might have possibly arrived at these field equations. It is worth asking that question. So let us ask before that the following question. In formulating laws of gravitation, what do you ask? You ask three questions. The first question is, when can we say that there is no gravitational field? Secondly, you can ask, what are the equations which determine the gravitational field in vacuum outside of the material body? 
The third question that you will ask is, what are the equations of the gravitational field in regions of space where matter is present? Well, Newton asked all these three questions, and let us recall what Newton's answers were. The gravitational field is described by a scalar potential U in Newtonian theory. And the condition for the absence of gravitational field is that U is equal to zero, obviously. Second is, in the regions of space outside of matter, the equation describing the field is that del squared U is equal to zero. And in regions of space where there is matter, del squared u is minus 4 pi 0, which is Poisson's equation. So Einstein sought to generalize these three equations. He had already come to the conclusion by then that uh, gravity should be described in terms of curvature of space-time. And that took a very long time for him to arrive at that, but we will not pick up the story before this. We will see how he modified this. Well, in the absence of gravity, particles experience no acceleration. Therefore, d2 xi ds squared is zero. Now, let us look at this case of a particle in free space, but let us look at it artificially from a curvilinear coordinate system. You know that in a curvilinear coordinate system, there are fictitious forces like um, centrifugal force, and Coriolis force, and so on. So what you find is that d, d2 x ds squared is not zero. There is, in fact, an acceleration. And this acceleration is purely by virtue of the fact that we are looking at the motion of the particle from a curvilinear coordinate system. There are no forces. So we, let's go back to the question. What is the condition, then, that there is no gravity anywhere. That is the condition, that necessary and sufficient condition for that is that you must be able to find a coordinate system where all these artificial accelerations, which are described by these Christoffel symbols, gamma, i, j, k, identically vanish. If you can find such a coordinate system, because, you know, you may find acceleration simply by virtue of the fact that you are in a rotating frame or in an accelerating rocket. That's not real acceleration. So a necessary and sufficient condition for the absence of gravity is that there must exist a coordinate transformation where all the Christoffel symbols vanish identically. Now, Riemannian geometry gives a precise answer to this question. And that answer is that a necessary and sufficient condition for absence of gravity or the vanishing of the Christoffel symbol, is the Riemann Christoffel tensor is equal to zero. So that equation is equivalent to Newton's equation, u is equal to zero. So that is the necessary and sufficient condition, and that is Einstein's zeroth law of gravity. Fine. OK. Now let us go to the second, or the first law. Now, Einstein knew that in order to modify Laplace's equation, he must take into account special relativity. And before that, so we are not dealing with matter, so he made a guess that the generalization of del squared u is equal to zero is this contraction of the riemann christoffel symbol, which gives you the Ricci tensor Rjk, must be equal to zero. Now, in case you're not familiar, this equation in this magenta box is like Laplace's equation, a second-order differential equation. There are 10 equations for 10 coefficients of the metric tensor, which are the Gij's. So this equation is precisely equal to uh, del squared u is equal to 0. So Einstein's generalization of Laplace's equation is that the Ricci tensor is equal to 0. How do you know this guess is correct? Because if you go to the limit where the velocity of light goes to infinity, you should get the Newtonian limit, and this, in fact, does reduce to Laplace's equation. So now let us look at the third and final equation of gravitational field, which is Poisson's equation. Now, Einstein knew, this is what I was trying to say at the time, 
that in Newtonian physics, you are dealing with only the matter density, whereas in special relativity, you have to deal with the energy and momentum tensor, whose uh, diagonal elements are rho c squared minus pressure, minus pressure, minus pressure, or depending on what signature you use for the metric, right? So he was tempted to say that the generalization of Poisson's equation would be that the Ricci tensor is equal to some kappa times the energy momentum tensor. This would be the natural generalization. Unfortunately, this did not work, and this took almost two years to figure out. The reason is, you know in special relativity, conservation laws follow from the divergence of the energy momentum tensor being equal to zero. All the conservation laws follow from this. But we are now dealing in curved space-time, and therefore, you have to generalize that to covariant divergence of the energy momentum tensor is equal to zero. Covariant derivatives are just the generalizations of ordinary derivatives in curved space. Therefore, the guess that the generalization of Poisson's equation will not work because whereas the covariant divergence of the right-hand side is zero because of conservation laws, Mathematically, the covariant divergence of the Ricci tensor happens to be not zero. Okay, so Einstein struggled with this for um, one and a half years. He struggled with it for one and a half years because he was not aware of a mathematical identity which is known as Bianchi identity, which says that whereas the covariant divergence of R, I, J is not zero, the covariant divergence of R i j minus one half G i j times R is zero. Okay, so once he realized that the, the Bianchi rediscovered Bianchi identities, he realized that the correct generalization of Poisson's equation is not R i j is equal to kappa T i j, R i j minus G i j R is equal to kappa T i j, where you have to find what this coupling constant K is. So that is the last job. And that is done in the following way. He did this in the following way. You know that in the weak, Einstein didn't know what the metric would be in the presence of the gravitational field, but he knew what the metric ought to be in the weak gravitational field. And this is just our time dilatation. The rate of ticking of a clock is changed in a Newtonian potential. And you can use this metric to find the limiting form of Einstein's equation in the limit c tending to infinity. In other words, you can take Einstein's complicated equations, use this metric and ask in that limit, what do these equations reduce to? These equations reduce to del squared u is equal to one half kappa rho c to the power four. Please try to verify this. Please try to verify this, okay? That is, that is one way for you to really dig into all these Christoffel symbols, how they are related to derivatives of the metric tensor and so on. These are things if I do on the board won't sink in. You just have to sit down with a pad and struggle through this algebra, okay? But you know that in the Newtonian limit C turning to infinity, what you should really get is Poisson's equation. And therefore, this identification immediately tells me that kappa is equal to minus 8 pi g by c to the power 4. And then you have Einstein's field equations. Okay, fine. Very good. So that is Einstein's field equations. And please appreciate that uh, this equa these equations have conservation laws built into them, whereas Maxwell's equations of the electric and magnetic field do not have conservation laws built into them. You have to supply the conservation laws. Some of them. Conservation of charge is built in through the displacement current and so on. So now, um, before saying, see, these are all familiar to most of you, so at least one or two things I say should be new to you. And so please permit me to take a few minutes to make some remarks 
about a person who I think was one of the greatest scientific minds of any century. Um, Carl Schwarzschild was a mathematician of very great powers. He was an experimental physicist. He was an observational astronomer. And he was a geometer. And he was also an officer in the German army fighting the Russians in the Russian front during the First World War when he received a preliminary announcement of Einstein's paper on general relativity, which Einstein had read in the German Academy of Sciences in Berlin. And immediately, he worked out the exact solution to Einstein's equations. Now, when, and then he sent a postcard to Einstein, and Einstein was absolutely astonished to receive this because he, he, he wrote back to Schwarzschild saying, I never thought anybody would ever find an exact solution to this complicated equation. I am delighted. And then Einstein went to the German Academy and presented Schwarzschild's result on his behalf. And within a month, Schwarzschild sent Einstein a second paper where he had worked out the exact space-time geometry for a fluid, a sphere of perfect fluid. So it is in that paper that he established that the radius of any object must be greater than 9 by 8 of the Schwarzschild radius. So Einstein went to uh, the German Academy once again and read Schwarzschild's second paper. And then within four weeks, Einstein went to the German Academy again to read an obituary of Carl Schwarzschild. And as Carl Schwarzschild was dying in the Russian front, he wrote the complete quantum mechanical theory of the Stark effect, which had been then discovered. This was all in 1916. But in the year 1900, when he was the president of the German Astronomical Society, he went and read a paper before the Astronomical Society estimating the curvature of our universe. Observational constraints on the curvature of the universe. This was 16 years before Einstein's paper. And what motivated him to do this was a paper by the great Riemann in 1852, where he actually said space may be curved and may be non-Euclidean. So Carl Schwarzschild said, if that is true, let me see from an observational point of view, can I put limit on the radius of curvature? So he actually gave a number for the radius of curvature of space. You know. So take some time out and read about this most remarkable man, particularly his work in astronomy, instrumentation, photometry, and uh, mathematics. Okay. So now, before we proceed, since, at least according to Chandrasekhar, there were two important watersheds in relativity after 1915, November 25th, this was the first one of them, it, we, this deserves to be remembered, and let us write this down for future reference. ds squared is, I don't want to make mistakes while Have I used small r or capital R? Small r. I, sometimes I change the signature of the matrix. You can figure that out very easily. And I do that and correct it. Sorry, d theta squared, d phi squared. No, there's a mistake, right? So, the first exercise for you, I'm giving you a series of exercises. Please demonstrate to yourself that this solution does satisfy Einstein's field equations. Sorry? 
Yeah, inside, inside that, outside that, yes. So, first exercise for you is to plug this into, use this to calculate the uh, various tenses and show that <clears throat> it does satisfy. So, this term represents the warpage of time, and this term represents the warpage of space. Now, you notice that this leads to this gravitational redshift of the light emitted from the star's surface, and that follows from uh, this term. And you notice that at the radius 2 gm by c squared, the redshift goes to infinity. And that was the source of trouble and the reason why a lot of people, including Einstein, did not take this solution very seriously for a very long time. So if nu1 is the frequency of light emitted, then the received frequency nu2 is related by this expression, and nu2 goes to zero as r approaches 2 gm over c squared, and the star will appear black. Now, that surface, which is known as the Schwarzschild radius or the gravitational radius, that sphere of uh, that radius is the event horizon in the theory. It's an event horizon because it's a semi-permeable surface. Things can go into the horizon and not come out. Now, what I would like to now discuss are the last two points which are all very well known, but let us make sure that we really understand them and why they occur. The point is that once you enter the Schwarzschild sphere, there is no way you can arrest your collapse and say, let me stay put here by getting into an orbit. You have necessarily to go to smaller and smaller r till you hit the central singularity. The only allowed trajectories are those along which matter will fall to the center uh, into the singularity. Now we want to understand this result. Now let's go back to the Schwarzschild metric. First thing, of course, to, is to understand what are these variables r and t, theta and phi, we know. We have to be very clear about what r and t are. So t is time, r is coordinate, but uh, for whom? Who's coordinates whose time? Now, this t that comes in Schwarzschild metric is the rate of ticking of a clock of an observer at infinity. And this r is not really the coordinate, is not the distance between that observer and some point uh, near the star. What it is, is the following. If this is the gravitational center of the star, this is the gravitational potential, if we draw a series of circles around it of different radii, then this then the, if the circumference of that circle is 2 pi r, then r is the circumference divided by 2 pi, okay? If I have two concentric circles of radii r1 and r2, the distance between the two circles dr is not equal to r2 minus r1, which it would be in Euclidean space, but that distance is really an integral of dr divided by square root of 1 minus the gravitational radius by r. That is just this factor, easier to write. So instead of 2 gm by rc squared, I will from now on write rg by r. And that is greater than r2 minus r1. And that is what is telling us that space is curved. And therefore this, excuse me, therefore this, which comes in the Schwarzschild metric, is the curvature factor. Okay? And the curvature factor goes to zero at the Schwarzschild radius in this coordinate system. Now, Schwarzschild metric is valid for, not just for a single spherically symmetric body, but a collection of bodies, as long, and the bodies could be in motion, as long as you can describe them as a spherically symmetric system. But now let us ask, I have a more complicated system. 
what will be the metric at very large distance? Now, I want you to verify this. If you get stuck, go to Landau and Lipschitz, that the metric at very large distances can always be written as the Galilean metric, minus 2 gm by rc squared dr squared plus c squared dt squared. And this is a very small correction. Please do this calculation and convince yourself that the Schwarzschild metric at large distance or any metric at large distance can be written in that form. Or alternatively, you can write the, this metric also in this form, ds squared is this c squared d, dt squared minus 1 plus 2 gm by rc squared dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. In other words, slight modification of the Euclidean metric and the slight modification, you notice that this doesn't come in the denominator now. This is 1 plus 2 gm. It is almost as though you have expanded that curvature factor in Schwarzschild metric and kept only the first term in the expansion. But I would like you to verify these two relations. This is important because when you're dealing with an astronomical body, very often one doesn't use the Schwarzschild metric or the curve metric. One would use the metric appropriate at very large distances. Okay. Now, I want to discuss the effective potential in general relativity, but let us first recall what is the effective potential in Newtonian theory. In Newtonian theory, the energy of a particle is half mv squared minus gm over r, and the angular momentum L is mr squared times d phi by dt. Now, v squared is simply dr by dt whole squared plus r phi dot whole squared, which L squared by mr squared is that. So I can now write half dr by dt whole squared is equal to the energy over m minus square bracket minus gm over r plus l squared over 2mr squared. So if I take this potential energy to this side, what I have is kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to the total energy per unit mass. So this quantity inside that magenta circle is very often called as the effective potential. And that's what is plotted here. This is the gravitational attractive potential minus g over r. And this is the centrifugal barrier, L squared by 2mr squared, the second term. And the solid line is the sum of the two. So the important thing is that the Newtonian effective potential always has a minimum. Now, what are the orbits in Newtonian theory? This is Goldstein's second chapter or third chapter. So, what we say in Newtonian theory is if the particle is at the minimum, this is the radial coordinate r, then its orbit is a circular orbit with that radius. The orbit is circular. But if the energy of the particle is such that the particle is not at the minimum of the potential, and if that is the energy, then as the particle is going around in a circle, it is also having a radial oscillation in that harmonic tension. And, and what happens is that the orbits are no longer circular, the orbits are elliptical. The orbits are elliptical and they are closed ellipses. They are closed ellipses because the period of oscillation, period of the circular motion is precisely equal to the period of radial oscillations. Okay? Now I want you to prove that to yourself because I want you to then repeat that for general relativity. So I'll write down how you go about doing that in a minute. So with this background, let us write down the effective potential in Einstein's theory. 
The constants of motion in Einstein's theory are the angular momentum per unit mass, let us say, which is r squared d phi d tau, not d phi dt, where tau is now the proper time. And the energy per unit mass is, in special relativity, energy is dt by d tau, which will give you 1 over square root 1 minus v by c squared, whereas in general relativity, the energy per unit mass is 1 minus r g by r into dt by d tau. Now, let's look at the short shell metric in the, say, uh, equatorial plane. That's why the theta terms I have suppressed. Substitute for dt and d phi into that equation from above. dt is there, d phi is there. Substitute. And then you can get an equation. dr is equal to c d tau into the square bracket to the power 1 by 2 exactly as we did in Newtonian theory. And then you'll get, just as in Newtonian theory, dr by dt whole squared has been replaced by 1 over c squared dr by d tau whole squared, e over m whole squared, minus this thing. So the effective potential in Einstein's theory of gravity is this quantity. So the second exercise for you today is to actually do this and get this effective potential. Do it this afternoon, please. It's all absolutely straightforward, but still, at once in your life, you should actually go through this algebra. Okay, so I've written it out there. That's the way you write the expression, and that is the effective potential squared not effective potential. In Newtonian theory, it is E over M minus V over M. In relativity, it comes as square. So you have to keep that in mind. Therefore, the effective potential is the square root of this quantity, and that is plotted here for various values of angular momentum. Now, the first thing to notice is that in addition to the minimum, there is also a maximum, which was not there in Newtonian theory. Secondly, as the angular momentum is changed, the position of the minimum changes. I'm lowering the angular momentum, decreasing the angular momentum. The minimum moves to smaller and smaller radii. So, let's compare this now in the same slide. This is the effective potential in Einstein's theory. This is the effective potential in Newton's theory. And these are the corresponding plots. Just as we did here, we, could, we should now ask, what are the orbits around a black hole? And that is summarized in this figure. If the energy of the particle is such that it is in the minimum of this effective potential, then the orbit is circular, just as in Newton's theory. But if the energy is E2, the particle will execute an oscillation in the radial direction as well. The orbits are ellipses, but the ellipses are not closed because the period of this radial oscillation now is not equal to the period of circular motion. And that is the case because the curvature of this is different from the curvature of this ever so slightly. It is almost as though I've taken the Newtonian potential centrifugal barrier, pushed it to the left. And that makes this oscillation period slightly different. And that is why the ellipse is precise. If the energy of the particle is 4, then it will just go crash into the central black hole. But if the energy of the particle is precisely equal to 3, you have a maximum and not a minimum of the potential, and so what you would have is an unstable circular orbit. Particles come, they orbit the black hole for a while, and eventually they can either go out or they can fall in. Okay, so now I want you to verify all these things, so I will write down how you go about this, and then please do this. So the steps are the following. You do it any way you like, but uh, 
here is a suggestion. One is take both the potential and find dv by dr, set it equal to zero, find the value of r at which the potential has a minimum or a maximum. Two, express L over M, angular momentum per unit mass, in terms of L over M squared minus M R naught Three, as we would do in Goldstein, find the second derivative of the potential evaluated at R is equal to R naught, standard thing, and that will give you the frequency. You recall that in a parabolic potential, V over M, is equal to half omega squared x squared. So that is the frequency. Okay. Now, what I want you to do, do this exercise and calculate two frequencies, omega radial and omega phi. Very elementary steps. Just needs a little bit of patience, that's all. And show that in the Newtonian case, these two frequencies are equal, therefore the ellipses don't precess. Whereas in general relativity, these two frequencies are not equal, the ellipse precesses. And therefore find omega r minus omega phi and convince yourself you have found the precession of the perihelion of Mercury or the Hulse Taylor pulsar. Okay? This should take you about 15 minutes to do. You just have to sit quietly and do it. Okay? I could have done it for you, but I deliberately didn't want to do that for you. Okay, now let us proceed. You can copy this down later on if you like. So let's proceed to the discussion. Uh, things are going to get interesting. So let us now lower the angular momentum. Here is the Einstein effective potential for some angular momentum. The minimum is over there, the maximum is over there. Let us, these are my hand-drawn pictures, so please uh, give me some liberties. They don't come out exactly as I want to. So at some crit critical value of angular momentum, uh, um, you will find that there is no minimum anymore. The minimum and maximum coincide at a point of inflection, and that happens at the angular momentum value square root of 3 into m into c into the gravitational radius. Write this down. This is a magical number, very important number, when you're talking about orbits around black holes. And for that angular momentum, and for that point, there is a circular orbit. This circular orbit has a radius of three times the Schwarzschild radius. There, over there. And the velocity of a particle in this orbit is precisely equal to half the velocity of light. Now this is the last stable orbit because if I reduce the ang angular momentum is increasing in the upward direction. If I reduce the angular momentum further, there is not even this point of inflection. So this is the last stable orbit. Now what about unstable circular orbits such as this and that? You notice as I increase angular momentum, the radius of this unstable circular orbit moves further to the left. This is r equal to the Schwarzschild radius what you find is that the last unstable circular orbit is at a radius of 1.5 Schwarzschild radius, which is where the maximum will come when the angular momentum goes to infinity. Okay? For infinite angular momentum, the maximum of the curve will tend to be at 1.5 Schwarzschild radius, 
and the velocity of that particle will be equal to c at that point. But that's not a stable circular orbit. That's unstable orbit because after a few orbits, it'll fall into the black hole. So, uh, uh, let us summarize the, the, the properties of the last stable orbit. Its radius is equal to three times the short shield radius. Its angular momentum is square root of three mcrg. The energy is square root of eight over m mc squared. These are special numbers in relativity. Some important new result connected with the last stable orbit. An observer at infinity will see the particle orbiting the black hole at half the speed of light as measured by the local observer. And the period of revolution in the orbit is to be calculated like this. This is our equation. D tau is square root of 1 minus Rg by R d t. And by integrating, you'll get that the period capital T is equal to 12 pi Rg divided by square root of 2 by 3 into C. Okay, again, these are particular numbers that come very often when you read in the literature. Now, suppose the particle emits radiation and you are observing it from infinity. What will you see? Let us say the particle is orbiting in a clockwise direction. There will be blue shift there and red shift here and no shift at all. Now, the observed frequency will be related to the emitted frequency omega naught by this factor. Please notice that both special relativity and general relativity come into it. Okay? So one is the effect, effect on the clock due to gravity, and the other is the effect on the clock due to Lorentz contraction. So this formula has both blue shift and red shift. So if you take the plus sign in the upstairs, you take the minus sign in the denominator. If you take minus sign upstairs, you take the plus sign there. So when you do that and simplify, you find that the blue shifted frequency is equal to square root of 2 times omega naught. Red shifted frequency is square root of 2 divided by 3 omega naught. And this is the frequency at this point. Verify this, please. OK? Now I come to a very important new thing that occurs in general relativity, which is not there in Newtonian physics, which is gravitational capture of a particle. Let us say there is a particle at rest at infinity. Its energy is just the rest mass energy mc squared. As it falls in, that energy is conserved. It's a constant of motion. So what I have plotted here are uh, 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 these effective potential curves, and I'm going to lower the angular momentum. That is the effective potential curve for L is equal to 2 times mcrg, and that is the effective potential, as we saw before, square root of 3 into mcrg. Now, you notice that for this magical value of L is equal to 2 times mcrg, this maximum occurs at e over mc squared is equal to 1. And above this angular momentum, this horizontal line does not intersect Sorry, if, if, if angular momentum is less, if angular momentum is less, this horizontal line does not intersect these curves, and the particle will just go into the black hole. In other words, if the if the energy was, if the angular momentum was there, uh, and the energy is there, you know you will have an elliptical motion, uh, stable, unstable circular orbits, and so on. I'm lowering the angular momentum. If I lower the angular momentum below this. Uh, their particles will simply uh, fall in. 
Therefore, there is no turning point for the particle if the angular momentum is less than this critical value and the body is captured gravitationally. And there is no Newtonian analog of this result. So let us calculate the capture cross-section. Let us say at infinity, the particle has an impact parameter of v. It falls in that, along that yellow line. Its angular momentum, L, will be equal to m times the velocity it had at infinity multiplied by that impact parameter, mvb. And L less than 2 mcrg corresponds to an impact parameter of 2 crg by v infinity. Therefore, all particles with impact parameters smaller than this critical value will be captured by the black hole. Okay. Now, notice that this impact parameter is a very large number because the velocity at infinity is small compared to the velocity of light. So, this capture by a black body, uh, sorry, black hole, is a very important new input into our physics. The capture cross section is pi times this critical impact parameter b squared which is equal to 4 pi rg squared into c by v infinity whole squared. And please remember that this is a very large number. So the capture cross-section is very, very large. So if you want to read more about this, I recommend that you read Zeldovich and Novikov, Relativistic Astrophysics. Landau and Lipschitz says all of these things, but as usual, it will be in one or two sentences. So you have to have a lot of patience dig out the results. So whereas uh, Zeldovich and Novikov will have a more extended account of these things. So here is a summary. As I lower the angular momentum of the particle, I hit a critical angular momentum, which is 2 m c times the Schwarzschild radius, of which the particle is captured into a circular orbit, and after a few revolutions, it will fall into the black hole. Whereas if the angular momentum is less than this critical value, there is a direct capture. Please go back to the defective potential in Newtonian theory and convince yourself that there is no analogous uh, gravitational capture in uh, Newtonian physics. Because a particle can come and crash into the body. That is different. Okay, comments do and so on. All right. Now we need to examine the radial motion of particles and radial motion of light, orbital motion of particles and orbital motion of light. Because from an astrophysics point of view, this is what we are interested in. Now, let the particle be at rest at infinity. It doesn't have to be. All these formulae that I will write can be written just as well when the velocity at infinity is not zero, but some given value. Just the expression will be slightly more complicated unnecessarily. So as I said, the general expression for the energy per unit mass is the special relativistic uh, definition dt over d tau multiplied by this curvature factor 1 minus rg over r. Now since energy is a constant, d tau squared, I can, let's say this is equal to 1, E is equal to mc squared at infinity because the particle is at rest. Therefore, I can square this and take d tau on the other side. I'll get d tau squared is equal to 1 minus rg squared over r whole squared dt squared. Plug this into the Schwarzschild metric. And because we are dealing with radial motion, d theta is 0, d phi is 0. It's a very elementary algebra. But please do this. dr by dt is equal to plus or minus square root, I mean, 1 minus rg over r, square root of rg by r into c. What is this dr by dt? This is the velocity, quote unquote, of the particle as seen by an observer at infinity. You notice that for the observer at infinity, as the particle falls towards the black hole, as r approaches rg, 
this dr by dt will decrease. And finally, as r tends to rg, dr by dt goes to zero. In other words, as seen by an observer at infinity, the infalling particle will take forever and ever and ever to reach the Schwarzschild radius, which is a result that Snyder had found in 1939. Right? The collapse is slows down and slows down till finally it is frozen. These were the words of Oppenheimer and Snyder's paper, right? So, so that's where that result comes from, right? But this is not the physical velocity of the particle as measured either by a person standing near the black hole as it sees is going by, or as measured by the wristwatch of the particle itself. So we need to know that also. So, but please do this exercise, this elementary, it'll take about 100 seconds or 150 seconds, okay? So please do it. Now, so this is, this is the same result. But now, let us imagine that there is a Buckminster Fuller dome in this blue dome that I've constructed with infinitely rigid material. I have to use infinitely rigid material because the tidal forces by the time I come there are very strong and uh, it will be just torn apart and ask what would be the velocity as measured by a person sitting on the shell as he sees this particle go by. First, we have to be clear about what is the physical time. The physical time, d tau, is square root of g0,0 zero zero from the metric dt, or square root of 1 minus rg by r into dt. So you notice that as r tends to rg, d tau tends to 0. So the rate of ticking of the clock goes to 0 as the clock approaches the Schwarzschild radius. Now the proper radial distance, dr, as measured by the shell observer, is dr divided by the curvature factor, 1 minus rg by r square root. This is what I said in the beginning. That distance dr is not r2 minus r1, but the integral, that's what this is. This is a, for elemental distance. Therefore, dr by dt, or dr shell by dt shell, or the velocity of the partic infalling particle as measured by an observer on the shell near the black hole is 1 over 1 minus rg by r into the velocity as seen by the observer at infinity. So if I use the previous expression, if I use this expression for dr by dt over there, this cancels out what is in the denominator, and I will just get square root of rg over r into c. So you notice that as r tends to rg, this physical velocity tends to the velocity of light and not to zero. So as seen by either by the clock attached, either by the person falling in or by the person on the stationary shell, the velocity of the particle is increasing to c and the acceleration goes to infinity. So this is what Snyder had found, remember? And that's why that result was so astonishing. This totally divergent points of view. The acceleration is given by this expression and that goes to infinity as r tends to rg. Okay? Please, I urge you to do these calculations. They're all very elementary. I, each one of these things, I, I, I did them last night. All these calculations put together are only in two pages, okay? So, but, but I still insist that you should do it for yourself. So let us summarize the results. As seen from infinity, this will be the velocity of the freely falling particle. As seen by a local observer, this will be the velocity of the freely falling particle, measured by his wristwatch. So one picture is worth 10,000 words. So the velocity as seen by an observer at infinity goes to zero at the short shell radius. 
Whereas the velocity as seen by the shell observer approaches C at the short shell radius. Now we want to know how much time it will take to reach from R equal to some R1 to the short shell radius. Now, you know how to do this in Newtonian mechanics. If I drop a stone from top of Empire State Building, how long it will take to hit the ground? Now, the calculation here is exactly analogous, except that uh, the fact there will be some factors that is coming in from curvature of space and time. dr by dt is one my, the, 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 we had written this before, and this, of course, will diverge. So as seen by the distant observer, the free fall time is infinite. Now, what I want you to uh, appreciate is that the free fall time, as measured by the wristwatch of the freely falling observer, is perfectly finite. That time difference, and the reason why I'm showing this, is I need this factor for future reference. This is a very beautiful factor that we will use now. D tau is 2 by 3 Rg by C into square bracket R1, R1 by R halves minus R by Rg to the power 3 halves. Okay. So that is the time it will take to come from, fall from R1 to R. And that is finite. It is finite for two reasons. One is his wristwatch time is slowed down by the gravitational field, and his wristwatch time is also slowed down due to Lorentz contraction because the velocity is tending to velocity of light. Both these things are captured in this result. Now let us ask, Having fallen from infinity to Rg in a finite time, which is given by that expression, how much longer will it take for me to actually fall to the singularity? Well, I use the same formula. Now, the starting point is Rg itself. I'm just counting time from the short surface. Therefore, the first term is, uh, uh, one, no, there's something, yeah, this is one, and I want, the fi final destination is R is equal to zero, the singularity, therefore the second term vanishes, therefore the time taken to fall from the Schwarzschild sphere to the center is just two by three into Rg by C, as measured by the falling clock. So now I want you to estimate this in the coffee break. It will take you about a few seconds to do so. Do this for a solar mass black hole, Rg, for a solar mass object. Do this for the black hole at the center of a galaxy whose mass is 3 million solar masses. And do this for a black hole at the center of a quasar, which is 10 to the 9 solar masses. So you'll have three times. So you must have a feeling for how long it's going to be before you send your last email or WhatsApp message. Right? So have a feeling for this time. For one solar mass, a million solar mass, a billion solar mass. All you have to do is to put in this one number there, OK? But please do it. Now we go to the radial motion of photons. So far, we have discussed the orbital motion of particles and the radial motion of particles. Now let us discuss the um, radial motion of photons. Well, how do you calculate the motion of light? For light, the interval ds is zero. So you take the Schwarzschild metric, set the left-hand side is equal to zero, because its radial motion d theta is zero, d phi is zero, and the Schwarzschild metric simply gives for light dr by dt is equal to c into 1 minus rg by r. It just comes from this very trivially. All these terms vanish. This is for light. 
And therefore, this dr by dt, as seen by an observer at infinity, this expression will be different for a particle with a mass and for light. Okay? So don't think I'm repeating the same thing. The formula is slightly different. Huh? So make a note of that. So the distant observer will find that light is slowing down. But the physical velocity of light, which is the physical distance dx traveled in at proper time d tau, is just c. And it has to be c, and it better be c, because one of the premises of Einstein's theory of relativity is the principle of equivalence in its strong form, which asserts that the metric should always be locally Minkowskian. Special relativity must always be valid locally. So there is no violation even inside the black hole. Okay. Now let us uh, skip the algebra for the orbital motion of light and merely summarize it uh, by a diagram because more or less it is the same thing as for particles except that this impact parameter, etc., will be slightly different. So what we find is here is our black hole, and here is the impact parameter. 2M is the, this is taken from some book. They have put capital G and small velocity of light equal to 1. So that is really 2GM by C squared, or that is the short shell radius over there. This is one and a half short shell radius. 20, square root of 27 m, okay? Square root of 27 is 3 root 3 by 2. We have encountered this number in the previous plot. So, now let us see what it says. If the impact parameter of light is greater than, at infinity, is greater than this value, which is 3 root 3 by 2 times the Schwarzschild radius, then light can have a hyperbolic orbit, like the particles. But if the impact parameter is equal to this critical value, light will be captured into a circular orbit. The radius of the circular orbit is one and a half times the uh, Schwarzschild radius. You remember I had said before that in the effective potential, when the angular momentum goes to infinity, the maximum in the angular momentum tends to 1.5 times the gravitational radius, and that is the last unstable circular orbit, and the velocity will be equal to c, this even for material particle. So it should be for light also. So what happens is, the as the star collapses, this is what Snyder found. He said the light is progressively reddened and can escape over a progressively narrower range of angles. So as the star is collapsing, finally it will reach 1.5 Schwarzschild radius. And then the light emitted by it, regardless of whether it is radially emitted or tangentially emitted, will form a cloud going around it forever and ever and ever, and slowly the photons can leak out. So when you see an object which has become a black hole and a space-time singularity, what you will see is not signature of the Schwarzschild radius. You will see the star as it was when its radius was 1.5 times the Schwarzschild radius. You will see a reddened object, because the redshift has not become infinity, but it is very large, and the photons will slowly leak out. But the moment the impact parameter becomes less than this, then of course the photons are captured. Okay? So, uh, two magical numbers for light. One is this critical radius, 1.5 Schwarzschild radius, which is the last stable circular orbit for light. For particles, it was three times the Schwarzschild radius. Here's 1.5, and this is the critical impact parameter. Now, what is the story inside the horizon? 
Now, the short shell metric cannot be extended inside the horizon because at the horizon, which is r is equal to the short shell radius, this goes to zero. And when r is less than that, this becomes negative. This becomes negative, and this becomes positive. So time coordinate becomes space-like, and vice versa. So time coordinate becomes space-like, and r coordinate becomes time-like inside the short shell horizon. r equal to constant line cannot serve as the radial coordinate anymore, because the world lines of particles have to be described by time-like coordinate. They have to be inside the light cone. So I cannot use a world line which is going outside the light cone as, uh, as a marker, right? So this is why the Schwarzschild radius is a singularity, and people feared it. And this is why Einstein rejected it. Now, to some extent, this was very unfortunate, because people should have realized that these singularities that occur at r equal to rg is a manifestation of the particular coordinate system that Schwarzschild chose. Now, it all sounds very obvious to us today, but please remember that this finally came home only in 1958 with a paper by Finkelstein. And that led very quickly to the famous paper by Roger Penrose on the singularity theorem. But this was noticed already in 1926 by Eddington. What Eddington said was, but look, Schwarzschild used the wrong coordinate system. You should really use a coordinate system that falls with the photon. If I use a coordinate system that falls with the photon, there is no singularity. And that coordinate system of Eddington of 1926 was rediscovered independently by Finkelstein in 1958. So Finkelstein's paper was the one that was noticed and that triggered uh, the singularity theorems and so on. But what I would like to tell you is how you can see this, that there is, the, the Schwarzschild radius is perfectly harmless, not by a, a coordinate system attached to the infalling photon, but by a coordinate system attached to an infalling material particle. And that was done by Lemaitre in 1933. This is generally not known. Lemaitre, if you remember, was a Catholic priest in Belgium who had made this fundamental contribution to cosmology, which again was rejected by Einstein for a very long time. So what did, what did, uh, uh, what did Lemaitre actually do? What he said was, Instead of the coordinates small r, small t, theta, and phi, let me choose a coordinate system attached to an infalling particle. Therefore, instead of this small t as the time, the time I'm going to use is the proper time t of the infalling particle. And what is the for the r coord distance coordinate, what am I going to use? I am going to use the coordinate of the infalling particle. So let us say that at some time, capital T equal to zero, the infalling particle had a position coordinate r1. That is the coordinate that I am going to use now. Okay? In other words, I am going to use a coordinate system attached to an infalling particle. Now, uh, and that is what is uh, shown here. And uh, you will see, we will stop now and uh, pick it up uh, tomorrow. But you will see that the metric written in terms of these new coordinates, capital R and T, t capital T or tau, which is the proper time, is this, where I have replaced the Schwarzschild's coordinate R by capital R, which is uh, defined here, and small t by proper time, you know what I mean by that. So I will convince you tomorrow morning, when we begin, that this metric has absolutely no singularity at r 
G, which is the short shell radius, 2 gm by c squared. The met none of the metric coefficients g, zero, al g, alpha, beta have been singularities. The various invariants of the metric are perfectly regular. And the only singularity of that is at r equal to zero, which is, of course, the true space-time singularity. So we will stop there, but to summarize, I, I wish I had completed this, but, but I shouldn't rush this because, I was, because this was the beginning of the uh, new era in relativity and these beautiful pictures that Penrose started drawing with light cones being tipped and all that. So let us start with this uh, tomorrow all over again, okay? Are there any questions? What I have said. Please do these sums, all of them that I gave you this afternoon. Where is Harris? Make sure that they do all these things, okay? Um, then you'll feel good that uh, you, you, you've seen these results. Are there any questions? There is a clock. That, uh, yes. Uh, you see, right now we are not considering the charge of the central body, okay? Therefore, it should not matter at all. The only thing that will matter is the charged particles, by virtue of their acceleration, will radiate. And therefore, their motions will not be geodesics. They will deviate from the geodesic. Okay? But they will have to, because otherwise you will violate principle of equivalence. Just imagine, principle of equivalence says that freely falling bodies move along geodesics. Right? Regardless of uh, their mass. So this was the extension of the principle of equivalence, which gave substance to Galileo's discovery that the acceleration due to gravity is independent of the mass. Right? This was a great mystery. We didn't know why. This is the only acceleration which is independent of uh, uh, mass or charge or whatever it is. Right? So Einstein fixed that by saying that all accelerations are metrical in origin, they are just due to curvatures. Gravity is as much a fictitious force as centrifugal force or Coriolis force. And all freely falling bodies move along geodesics. Fine. But now I stick a charge, like you have done. Maxwell says it must radiate. Now by detecting the radiation, I should be able to tell that particle is actually uh, 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 radiating. But a particle moving along geodesics should not. So what it does is it deviates from the geodesic. So the charged particle that you're talking about, its motion will be slightly non-geodesic compared to particles which have no charge. But no other consequence unless you come to black holes which have a net charge. But we are not discussing those black holes at the moment. That's an interesting problem that was studied in the 1970s. Okay. Yes? Oh. This coordinate R minus C tau, uh, the denominator is getting zero. Yeah, but that is R is equal to C tau corresponds to R is equal to zero. Small r is equal to zero. That is the space time singularity. At R equal to RG, there are no, no zeros and no infinities. That is a beautiful thing, okay? Same thing in Eddington's coordinate system, but uh, uh, that Eddington just put in his book and nobody uh, read about this. Um, and even this, Lemaitre coordinate system, you'll find only in Russian books, because the Russians tend to be far more scholarly in their literature study and references. So that is where I found in Zeldovich discusses this. Otherwise, in standard books, don't, they, they pick up three. See, a necessary and sufficient condition to have made a contribution is you must publish in an American journal. Right? Therefore, uh, the T equal to zero is Finkelstein's paper in 1958. Uh, unless you read uh, the Russian books. And there you'll find both Eddington coordinates and this. Uh, hmm? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm glad you point. Tomorrow we'll discuss that. So uh, capital R is equal to C tau is small r equal to zero. And that space-time singularity is there, and the curvature goes to infinity there. You can verify there. Huh.